It's not news that Brooklyn is a global brand. There's a Dubai-based clothing company called the Brooklyn Cotton Company. The Brooklyn Soap Company is based in Hamburg, Germany. The Le Brooklyn pop-up at the Parisian department store Le Bon Marché Rive Gauche sold ball mason jars, which incidentally are made in Indiana. But when you think of Brooklyn the brand, you probably think of a bearded white guy who sells his own artisan kombucha and attachment parents his toddler, Zasper. If you're a hip hop fan, maybe you also think of Biggie and Jay, but for the most part, the branding of Brooklyn has largely excluded people of color and low income communities. Our next guest is a city councilman who represents Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, two neighborhoods that are rapidly gentrifying but aren't on the Brooklyn double-decker bus tour route. He's here to talk about how Brooklyn's rising tide can be doing more to lift all boats. We welcome Robert Cornegie to 112BK. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. Let's get this out of the way. You are very tall. How tall are you? So, unfortunately for me, according to Guinness Book, I'm only 6'10". I don't know if you guys know that recently I got the distinction of being the tallest elected official in the world by Guinness. That's right. Congratulations. Right. I thought I was 7 feet. Uh, The measurements that they took over the course of an entire day uh, averaged out to be 6'10". So I started the morning at 6'11 and 3 quarters and got an average measurement of 6'10". So I I don't know what to say, whether I'm actually 6'11 and 3 quarters or 6'10". But according to Guinness Book, I currently hold the record as uh, the largest, the tallest politician in the world at 6'10". So you had been going around thinking that you were close to 7 feet. Let's round up, right? Yes, absolutely. But now, in black and white, you're 6'10". According to the average, yes, I'm 6'10". Is it worth it? Is the honor worth losing those two inches in your mind? Uh, only because I love Brooklyn so much and I was able to bring that (laughs) distinction to Brooklyn, I'm going to say yes. But I'm sure that I will, uh, when one of my children breaks my record or something, uh, be upset about that two inches. Now, you have had some controversy because some other upstart politicians are saying, well, I'm taller than that. Right. Well, I welcome them to go through the battery of tests that Guinness Book puts you through. And at the end of that, we'll see where they stand as well. <laughs> Right, so right. Maybe they'll enjoy. lose three inches. Exactly. We'll enjoy. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the Shared Economy Weekend Initiative. Um, this is coming up in June. Talk to me a little bit about what it is and why it's important for you and your constituents. First of all, I believe that um, communities of color have traditionally gotten products at the end of their product life cycle. So when there's a new emerging industry like um, app-based, platform-based companies, um, uh, like transportation companies, Uber, Lyft, Juno, Zipcar, City Bike, or um, hosting companies like VBRO, HomeAway, or Airbnb, generally, um, as those companies grow, they don't benefit communities of color. So um, I wanted to see how this emerging economy uh, could benefit minority communities and push us to the front of the line uh, for once. Uh, Technology-based companies in general um, haven't created the algorithms to be as discriminatory as every other industry in this country. And I think it's a good opportunity for us to get in and see if we can ride this wave uh, to some level of success. So for example, um, in the past, We've done uh, app-based transportation companies, have done discounted rides to bars, lounges, and restaurants in Bed-Stuy on Friday, retail outlets on Saturday, and cultural institutions on Sunday. And anecdotally, there's been an uptick um, to the tune that some businesses that are restaurant-based or bar-based businesses have had to hire one more barmaid or one more cook or one more, so it also is a job creator as well. But the idea that the narrative in this city is that either you support brick and mortar businesses or you support this new emerging economy centered around app-based businesses and that they're mutually exclusive is something that I want to dispel. Well, it doesn't seem like, say, a black-owned restaurant in Bed-Stuy would be in direct competition with a company like Uber, for example. It seems like there's opportunity for overlap. So what what has happened is uh, the inability for the city to harness or um, monetize the presence of these app-based companies has created a narrative that says that they're generally bad. I'm saying in minority communities, it's the exact opposite. Uh, For example, in my district alone, we have 2,200 hosts, Airbnb, VBRO, so people who are using a portion, a small portion of their um, um, immediate residence uh, towards the shared economy. And what we're doing is being ambassadors to the rest of the world 
And we have the opportunity to introduce them to the businesses that we frequent in our communities and create an ecosystem that literally circulates the dollar eight times intentionally. So now, organically, that's happening. We want to harness it and make it a network and an ecosystem that, cre that can create jobs. So you're right that there has been um, a lot of negative controversy around um, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. For example, just yesterday there was a strike by Uber mm -hmm. and Lyft drivers. There have been studies that shown that more than half of Uber and Lyft drivers make less than minimum wage in their respective states. Um, Airbnb, of course, has been talked about part of a gentrification problem where people are, instead of um, leasing out their, their extra room or their extra apartment, to tenants, they're just using it to bring tourists in. How do you see this as part of um, an opportunity to make the shared economy work for your constituents? Listen, I, I think where it's against the law to use any of those app-based companies, and it's clear that there are distinctions that prohibit the use of Airbnb uh, and have regulated to the, it to the point that there are rules that you should follow. To the extent that you're following those rules and can earn some resources in a home where the prices are escalating, whether it's around taxes, property taxes, or, or whether you are a someone who is um, a senior who has limited resources who now can use a small space in your home to generate income and revenue, I think you should have the opportunity to do that. But I think the entire community should benefit from that. So it shouldn't be these one-offs or isolated incidents. We can actually create an ecosystem. So for me, this has a three-pronged approach. It brings back the integrity of communities because you can travel short distances in particular communities to enjoy the particular fare that's indigenous to that community. I think there's something to be said for that. Right, so listen, a Starbucks on every corner isn't as beneficial as the local coffee house that where you're gonna get a Colombian cup of coffee which is much stronger and those, <laughs> that, those kinds of things. I'd, I'd like to see us move back to that. It's great for tourism and hospitality. It's great for the brand of Brooklyn and it's great to create an ecosystem that makes those people who were um, uh, the least likely to benefit the most likely to benefit. And I think that's what my Shared Economy Weekend wants to demonstrate how you can marry this brand new emerging economy. Like there's nothing that isn't shared at this point. I've had <laughs> an argument with my children, two arguments. One daughter was going to prom. And so I couldn't wait for her to go to prom. I'm getting ready to call the limo company. She's like, Daddy, nobody takes limousines anymore. <laughs> I, said, I said, what do you mean? She said, Dad, I don't, I don't want a limousine. I said, she said it is um, environmentally unfriendly to have a car Kids wait for me. Days. Kids these days. Out of, the, <laughs> out of the mouths of babes, right? So she said, Dad, why don't you just call one of the app-based car services, have them drop me off. If you want to be a big ball of dad, you can get me the XL, right? I'll travel with my girlfriends in the XL. It'll right. be in style. Right. And then it'll come back to get me when I need to go. It's safe. You can track the exactly. app. Exactly. You know where she is on that route. Right. So, so we're moving away from a way of doing business in a city where are we going to be as minority communities in that product life cycle, right? Where, where are we in that product timeline? We can be both consumers and business owners in this product life cycle and create an ecosystem in our communities that has everybody benefit, create jobs. I want to explore that, which is why, you know, I was very proud to be invited to MIT to have a discussion about the shared economy and whether or not it's truly a pathway to economic democracy. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a great discussion. Here's a pitch for your shared economy weekend, because I think that on the apps, you should have like, you know, there's like an Uber Eats option. You should have sort of a lucky dip or spin the wheel option where you get to call a car and wherever that guy wants to take you, if he wants to take you to his cousin's spot, that's where you go. Because that that's sort of the problem when you like, you know, you have to know where you're going in order to hail a ride based app. So, service, so right? that, that is an awesome idea. And, and hopefully... Um, it won't cost me to use it. <laughs> um, but so one of the one of the greatest benefits to going to uh, an institution like MIT to have this lecture mm. was first of all it was graduate students and professors that I lectured in front of, and all of them either had app-based companies that could enhance this shared economy model. And this weekend, by the way, they invited me there because they think it's a model that's replicable in underserved communities around the world. Sure. So there were people there who had proposals already for products similar to what you're saying that could enhance that experience. So 
while I thought I was going there to, to lecture, I learned more about what we can do from younger folks and academics around this who don't have a stake in it other than from a social justice perspective. So we touched briefly on how one criticism of Airbnb, when done improperly, is that it can displace people. Absolutely. But you actually um, introduced a suite of 17 bills that was just passed by the city council that sure. aims to prevent and reduce displacement. Can you talk to me a little bit about what these bills will change and why it's so important right now, especially for your communities? Right. So, so one of the bills I introduced um, is about buyouts. So what's happening now is in gentrifying communities, people are being offered buyouts to leave um, uh, long-term, sustainable, affordable housing units. Sure. Uh, when, if you leave, sometimes they can jack the rent up. You know, it can be taken off the market as an affordable unit. Someone came to my office who took a buyout, $10,000. They thought that was a lot of money. Mm. That wasn't even the first and last month's rent for them to move into a new place in the area that they were familiar with. Wow. And had they been advised that any unit you take after this one is going to be luck. four times as yeah. much. And, you know, what the market, going market rate was, they had no idea and were displaced legally. So that's a legal displacement. Mm -hmm. They signed a document that said if you take this money, you'll move in a certain amount of time. My bill says that you have to give full disclosure about market rents and also about comparables in that area before someone signs and takes a buyout. So there's another check that they have to say that I read and understand. Sure, that informed there consent. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so the suite of bills was centered around that premise mm -hmm. that people are being displaced and landlords are being somewhat unscru unscrupulous by using um, every legal discourse or recourse that they have to do that. That's legal to do. It's a little immoral when you know that that person, that amount of money won't is not it's not a sustainable amount of money. Right, right. Unless that person is planning on moving to the Rust Belt. Yeah, basically. It's not going to do them much basically, good. Basically informing consumers, which is which is part of what the suite uh, intends to do, um, and making landlords more accountable for these deals that they're making so that people can make intelligent decisions is, 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 the, is the premise and basis for that mm -hmm. suite of bills, which I'm proud to sponsor. Councilmember, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you.